Hello everybody, welcome to another video from EGIS Associates, now part of the Davy Resource Group. You know, as GIS applications continue to get more powerful, um, they're really requiring a lot more computer resources in order to run successfully. And that means that we really have to know our hardware because the days of being able to go to IT and just ask for a new computer without giving them some idea of what we need or are kind of behind us. So it really makes it important that we know as GIS users and practitioners and professionals a little bit more about computer hardware and the various components that go into um, a system. And so what I want to do in this video is kind of run through some of the basic parts that make up uh, a computer, right? We want to look at all the various components in general terms. I'm not going to get down into the weeds. It, you know, if, if y'all want a video that talks more about specific components within a system, you know, let me know down in the comments. I'll be happy to put one together. Uh, if you'd like to know more about motherboards or more about cases or video cards or CPUs or hard disk or all that, we can do that. But what I want to do with this video, and the reason it's entitled uh, Computer Parts 101, just to really give you a foundational understanding of the basic components that go into a computer so that when you do need to go to IT and tell them, hey, I need a new computer, uh, you can also then relay to them certain specs that they will need in order to go get you a system that is really sufficient to be able to run modern GIS applications, right? So that's what we really want to get into here to make sure you understand what the basic parts are and some things you need to consider. Like I said, I'm not going to get down in the weeds on this stuff. I'm just going to give you some basic understanding. So the basic components of any computer, and it really doesn't matter whether it's a desktop or a laptop or even a tablet, they're all going to have some basic computers. There's going to be a case, something that the computer goes into, right, that contains it. There's going to be a power supply. How do you get power to the components within the system? You're going to have some sort of motherboard. And that's the, you know, the, the foundation. We'll talk more about that. You're going to have a processor. You're going to have memory. You're going to have to store files and data and things like that. So you can have storage. Obviously, you've got to display that information. And then you've got to interact with um, the, the system, right? So we're going to have user input devices. And so every computer, like I said, regardless of whether it's a laptop or a desktop or even a tablet, is going to have these basic components. Now, some of these you can spec. Now, for the most part, I would say 90% of the, the GIS community um, is going to buy pre-built systems. You're going to go to Dell or HP or Asus or Micron or whatever your preferred vendor is. Um, and pick from their list of pre-built systems and then customize within the limits of whatever that vendor is what, you, what specs you want. Okay. Now, a few of us like myself will go and build our systems from scratch. I'll actually go to um, Micro Center or Newegg or, or whatnot, Amazon, and I'll pick all of the components, all of these things. I'll pick my own case. <laughs> I'll pick a, a power supply, I'll select a motherboard, a processor, memory, and buy all of those components individually so that I get a system that's exactly what I want. But that's not what most of y'all are going to do. You don't have that luxury. You're going to go, like I said, on a pre-built system from Dell or HP or Lenovo or whoever um, with that. But there are going to be certain things, even with that, that you can specify. And that's what we really want to focus on. I mean, you're not going to be able to pick a case. Dell uses whatever cases they use. Lenovo, HP, all use whatever cases they use. Um, your power supply, they're going to size that accordingly to the system. They have power supplies that they use and whatnot. Um, and in certain things like motherboards, you're not really going to be able to specify either. But there can be components that are on that motherboard uh, that you can have some input or, or specify, or at least you want to check for. So we're going to get down into those things that you can look at and specify that are components within the system. 
So we're gonna go ahead and start with the, the motherboard, right? So the motherboard is the foundation of your computer, right? It's what ties all of the various other pieces together, the processor, the video cards, the, the memory, the storage, all of that are tied through the motherboard. It's gonna provide the way all of these components talk to one another through what they call a bus. And there's various buses that are with, uh, within um, a motherboard, depending on what's talking to what and have different speeds and whatnot on it. Again, I'm not gonna get down into all of that. You can see here's a good example of a, a motherboard. This is actually the motherboard that's uh, currently in my computer uh, that I built. So you're gonna have like these slots that are right in here. Those are your memory slots. That's where your RAM goes. This socket or this square uh, piece here, which is called a socket, is where the CPU or the processor is gonna go. Um, this big thing back here is where your IO or user interface connections are gonna be back here. Uh, this part right here, this L with these uh, heat sinks on it, this is your VRM or your power delivery system for the motherboard on here. Uh, this connection section here is where your hard drives will plug in, your SATA drives. Okay, before my phone chimed in, we were interrupted. Again, this is where your hard drives for your SATA connections are gonna plug in, right? These slots that are here are for various cards, like your video card or video capture cards or network cards or whatever other um, uh, expansions you wanna put into your computer will go here. Uh, then you'll have other various connections around for things like USB ports, uh, for your front panel on your computer case, uh, for sound, whatnot. And then this little uh, thing right here is uh, a actually a battery that goes on to the motherboard. And that battery keeps power to the motherboard, so things like your time, uh, your other various settings that are in your BIOS, which is like the operating system for the motherboard, are uh, maintained so you don't lose those settings when you lose power. So that's the little, it's like a watch battery type thing, right? So this is your motherboard. Again, the foundation for your computer. Now, again, if you're buying pre-built systems, you're not gonna be able to specify which motherboard, but the things you do wanna look at are, are like what type of memory is supported. Is it DDR4? Is it DDR3? Um, what's the maximum amount of memory it supports, right? Does it support 32 gigabytes, 64, 128 or more? Um, you'll also want to look at the number of, of channels. So typically you're either going to have a single channel or dual channel um, memory motherboard. You can usually tell that by the number of slots. If you can see it, um, this has four slots. So it's a dual channel memory motherboard. What that means is that two slots are paired together and two other slots are paired together. And what you want is to put your memory into two slots that aren't paired together if you only have two memory chips. Uh, what that does is allow those to, to run faster and communicate faster in very general terms. I'm not gonna get down the weeds, but uh, you typically wanna have dual channel memory in your system like that. If you only have two slots, then you're gonna have more than likely single channel memory on there so you can tell that usually uh, when you look at the specs for the vendor on what's the maximum number of ram amount of ram supported as well as it will sometimes specify whether it's dual channel or single channel so you want to do that the other thing you can look at with the motherboard or that is usually connected with the motherboard is networking right how do you plug this up so you can get to the internet get to your servers you know get to printers all of those things so you want to make sure, does it have Ethernet support, right? That's a cabled connection. Does it have Wi-Fi support if you need it? Or does it have support Bluetooth connections on there? Um, and there's other types of connections on there. So does it, you know, what USB connections? Do you have USB 2.0, uh, 2.1, uh, USB, was it 3, Type-C, all of those things? Again, you want to make sure you're looking at those uh, connections as well. All of that again is tied back to the motherboard, right? So I think we got a good foundation on that. Uh, obviously next is the processor, the CPU. Right? There you can see a picture of, of the CPU that's running in my system. 
This is a Ryzen uh, 2700X is what I have. So it's a generation behind the current CPU that is out there. Um, and just for general information, I heard last night um, on one of the YouTube channels that I watch that Ryzen uh, Zen 2 is coming out or Zen 3, Zen 3 to Zen 2. Anyway, the Ryzen uh, 4000 CPUs are about to come out this October, November timeframe. So that'll make mine three generations behind, but it's still a very good CPU. Now, the CPU or processor, CPU, computer processing unit, um, is the brains of the computer. This is really what handles all the calculations. So when you're running from a GIS perspective, any sort of data analysis, this is really what's getting hit hard, right? It's, it's leveraging that processor to make those calculations. And there's really primarily for computers, not talking about mobile devices, but primarily for computers, two makers of CPUs. It's either Intel or AMD. Um, there is maybe a couple other smaller ones, but the, the main ones are Intel and AMD. They both make very good processors. Yes, I have a Ryzen, which is from AMD here, but that's not to say that you wouldn't get as good or better performance out of an Intel. Um, the new chips that are all making are pretty uh, amazing. So when you go to pick, um, since it really, from a GIS perspective, shouldn't matter necessarily whether it's Intel or AMD, um, there's other things you got to consider. So first is the number of cores and threads. So when you look at a CPU, um, it's going to list the number of cores. And really what you need to think of is cores is kind of like, um, what's the word I want to look at? Mini processors on the main processor, right? So if you see uh, dual core, that means it's got like too many processors. Quad core, four. But nowadays with some of these chips, like uh, my Ryzen 2700X, I think is a six core processor. So it's got six mini processors. Um, now, threads, you can think of is kind of like the pipelines into those cores, right? The pathways to transfer data in and out. And so you're either going to have um, a, a single thread processor or a hyper-threaded processor. So when you get hyper-threaded, that means you're going to have multiple threads going to each one of those cores. Um, typically, it's two. So my, the Ryzen you see here, as I said, I think it has six cores, but it's got 12 threads, meaning each core has two pathways into it, um, which means it can process that much more data in there. Whereas a single core or a single thread CPU uh, would only have if it's six cores, it's got six threads. So that limits um, the amount of data that can transfer through there. Uh, you think, well, if that's the case, why aren't all CPUs uh, hyper-threaded? Well, it's because it wasn't until very recently that programs, applications, were really set up to utilize that hyper-threaded capability. So for example, if you're running ArcMap from Esri, it's not set up to really utilize a hyper-threaded CPU. It, it, when it was written, those didn't exist. So you don't get a lot more uh, performance with a hyper-threaded CPU than you would with a single-threaded CPU. However, ArcGIS Pro is written uh, with hyper-threading in mind, so you will get better performance if you're running Arc Pro with a hyper-threaded CPU. Matter of fact, it's what Esri recommends you run with Arc Pro. So that is something to consider. If, you, if you're just running ArcMap and you don't anticipate running Pro or any other uh, type of application that would support hyper-threading, then going with a single uh, single threaded uh, CPU would be perfectly fine, uh, might even be a little cheaper, uh, but again, something to look at. The other thing you will look at is the clock speed, which is really how fast those cores are able to process data. So the higher the clock speed, the faster it's going to, to look uh, work. Um, I know there's some uh, processors that can get up to, was it five gigahertz uh, on the clock speeds? Um, that usually requires some overclocking and things, but anyway, we don't get to that. Uh, so, but you're probably looking more along the lines with current CPUs at a, a four, 
3.8 to 4.1 gigahertz clock speed uh, would be good. Um, and then lastly is cache. So on the CPU, there is memory that the processors, those cores are using as it's doing calculations and having to read and write values. It initially writes it to that cache. So it's going to write it off to the cache, which is very high speed memory that's on the CPU. So you want to look at that. The more cache you have on the CPU, the, the better performance is going to be. So that's something to keep in mind. Which then brings us into the memory for the computer, right? So we have cache on the CPU, but then we're going to have RAM or random access memory that we put into the computer. Okay, and this is once the CPU has filled up the cache, it starts writing things to RAM. And so um, as it's doing those calculations and it pushes off into RAM, it's, it's going to be there. Also applications like your, your Arc Maps and your Arc Pros and Adobe Photoshop, whatever, are also when you launch them, that's going to write some information into the RAM. Anything that it needs to get to quickly, it's going to write into RAM. So here's a couple of RAM sticks. You can see these. this is the RAM that uh, um, I first had on my system. Uh, these are two 8 gigabyte sticks or memory modules that are, are slotted in the, uh, the slots that we were talking about earlier. And so for, for GIS purposes, I wouldn't go with a system that had less than 16 gigabytes of RAM. If you're just doing web surfing, Word, Excel, um, Office type applications, and you can probably get by with only eight gigabytes of RAM. I wouldn't go anything less than eight gig in today's environment with all the stuff that we do on computers. Uh, but for GIS, 16 is the minimum. I've now upped my original 16 to 32 gigs of RAM. So again, the more, the better. I say that, but I need to caveat it to some extent. If you're running ArcMap, ArcMap is an older 32-bit application. Um, it was originally written in 1999, right? A lot has changed since then. So what that means being 32-bit is it can only use up to 4 gigabytes of RAM. Now, that doesn't mean you need to get a system with only 4 gigs of RAM in it because you've got things like your operating system and other apps that will also eat up RAM. So again, if you're only running ArcMap and Arc Catalog, not using ArcSync or ArcGlobe, um, then 8 gig might be enough for you. However, if you're running Arc Pro, or even I think the 64-bit version of QGIS or whatever else uh, out there, then you definitely want 16 gig because they are 64-bit applications, which means they can use pretty much as much RAM as you can uh, put in your system. So the, the more RAM you have, the better, to an extent. Um, like I said, for most people, if you're just doing basic uh, GIS work, like with vector maps, um, working in 2D, then 16 is probably good enough. If you're going to start getting into things with 3D rendering, working with LiDAR data, uh, or um, any sort of other 3D information, big raster sets or huge vector sets, then again, you want to go um, over 16. It really just depends on what you're doing. So keep that in mind. Um, again, I wouldn't go less than 16 on any GIS computer I was getting nowadays. Next, you got to pick storage. How am I going to store data on my system? What am I going to do? Well, you have basically three options um, when you're trying to pick storage for a computer. You can go with a traditional hard drive, which is what you see in the upper corner here. That's uh, a mechanical drive that has platters that spin. Um, that's the kind of hard drive that we've been using pretty much since the x86 came out. Okay. Um, more recently, we've had SSDs come out or solid state drives. And even in these, you've got two types. You've got this traditional SATA drive that's about the size uh, of a credit card, a little bit bigger. It's like two and a half inches um, wide on there. They're pretty small, compact, really thin, um, and have very good data transfer speeds. They're, they're much faster. They're easily two, three, or more times as fast as a traditional hard drive. 
even if you go with a 10,000 RPM hard drive. Uh, if you do go with a, a traditional hard drive for GIS, I wouldn't go anything less than a 7,200 RPM hard drive if it's going to be one of your primary drives, uh, drive that you're booting your system off of, drive that you're going to be accessing data from, running applications on. I wouldn't go less than 7,200. If you can go up to 10,000, that's even better because that really deals with the uh, data access times, reads, write speeds, and all that that go uh, with that. So the more RPMs, the, the faster the drive's going to perform with that. The, the newest type of drive we have is a PCIe NVMe drive. And you see that down here in this uh, lower right corner. It actually looks more like just a memory chip. And um, they're extremely fast. They're tied directly into the bus of your motherboard. It plugs right into a slot. You can see right here that's tied in the motherboard. It, exceedingly fast, even faster than the SATA SSDs here. So they're really good uh, for using as a boot drive. And a matter of fact, I should mention, you can mix and match these. Matter of fact, what you see here is pretty much all the drives I have on my uh, system, on my computer, right? So I have this NVMe drive here that is my boot drive. That's what uh, my OS, being Windows 10, is loaded on. It's what all of my uh, GIS programs are loaded on. Um, a few games are loaded on there, right? So that's what I use to boot. And my system boots exceedingly fast. I mean, it's within a couple of seconds, it's up and running. Um, much faster than what I had before. Then I have my SATA SSD drive that I put most of my data on, right? Uh, it's very, it's still fast, not as fast as this one, but it's pretty fast and it works with getting data on and off. I do a lot of my video editing for YouTube and stuff through that drive again, because the, the speeds are, are, are very quick. Then any other things that I need to I don't access all that often or all the time, but I need to access somewhat frequently, like uh, photos that I use in videos, uh, old data sets that I only reference every now and then. I put off on my traditional hard drive. I have a 7200 RPM uh, Western Digital. It's a two terabyte drive there, right? So I've got this 250 gig SATA drive is my working drive. I have a 500 gig NVMe drive for my boot disk and programs. And then set the traditional uh, hard drive for uh, quasi archiving, right? So it is possible to mix and match drives within a computer. Um, if you're trying to spec a new computer out, I would suggest uh, for GIS that at least you make sure your boot drive is some SSD, preferably an NVMe drive. Um, if you can't get that, then a SATA SSD um, is, is pretty good, certainly better than a traditional hard drive. If you do have no choice but to go with a traditional hard drive, then again, the faster the RPMs, the or the more RPMs, the, the better on that, okay? So these are some of the options you have. Uh, again, preference would be given to any sort of SSD with the NVMe being my first choice. They are not always cheap, uh, certainly more expensive than the traditional SATA SSDs that are out there because those have been out for a while. So technology has come a long way and, and come, the prices have come way down with the NVMe's being relatively new by comparison. So they're a little bit more expensive, uh, but well worth it. Like I said, the times on those are just phenomenal. If you go from a traditional hard drive to an NVMe boot drive on your computer, you're going to be blown away. I mean, you're just going to be amazed at the capabilities there. So of course, the next part of, of that is the display. Being GIS, we're very graphic oriented with maps and charts and things. So display is a key component of our computers. And this is really made up of usually two components. If we're talking a desktop, Right, we're going to have a monitor, and we're going to have some sort of, of graphics uh, capability. It gets the display from the computer to the monitor. Right, um, when we're looking at that, we're looking at either integrated graphics or a dedicated GPU. Okay, 
or a graphics processing unit. That's what GPU stands for. You may think of it as a video card, a graphics card, whatever you want to call it. For GIS purposes, I would not go with integrated graphics. And what that is, um, it's where the, the CPU and the RAM on your computer are also doing all the graphics processing, the, what you see on your screen. So every time you pan and zoom, those resources are being pulled away from other things and being used to redirect and show whatever it is that you need to look at on your screen. You really want, especially if you're using some of the more modern GIS applications like ArcGIS Pro or whatnot, a dedicated graphics card, a dedicated GPU. Um, it can be AMD, it can be NVIDIA, Intel is working on some that are supposed to be coming soon, probably next year. Not very impressed with what I've seen on those. But either AMD or NVIDIA right now are going to be your best bet. Uh, both of them are launching brand new uh, cards, a whole new generation of cards coming up here the uh, last quarter of 2020. So look at look for those. Um, to be coming out soon they're going to really ramp up performance built on whole new architectures so they're going to take graphics to a whole new level uh, both of these uh, that are coming out soon and the costs are coming down on what their previous generation was but that also means all the previous generation stuff which is all very good um, will also be coming down you'll be able to find a lot of those on the used market and things which or if you're going with a pre-built system uh, they they should be offering the second gen or the previous generation stuff at a discounted price too, so that should help drive those down. So when you're looking at um, video uh, display for a, a dedicated graphics card, what do you you want to look at? Well, first thing um, is the what connections, right? If you've already got a monitor, and most of us we're going to keep a monitor until it dies because we're not gamers, we don't really care about, you know, response times and super resolutions, you know, we don't need 8K. So we're gonna keep a monitor pretty much till it dies. At least that's been my experience um, here. As a matter of fact, this is this is my monitor here. And I tell you what, I paid for that. I'm not giving that, a, getting rid of that anytime soon. It's an ultra wide, it's a 43 inch curved Samsung monitor. Anyway. So what kind of connections? Is it VGA? Is your monitor so old that you've got to use a VGA connection? That's the, the is it oblong looking connector that's wide, has multiple pins in it. Uh, is it a DVI connection? So that's a little bit bigger than a VGA. It's got flat connections instead of round pins on it. Um, so is that what you need? Or do you have HDMI? Or you can go with that connection. Now I should point out that like the new cards from AMD and NVIDIA are going to support HDMI 2.1, which is a new spec for HDMI. So that's something to consider. Uh, you can always go backwards, right? So if I have a card that'll do HDMI 2.1, it'll also support HDMI 2.0 and 1.0, but it may not go the other way, right? So if I have a display that only does HDMI 2.1, video only does HDMI 2, that may not be cross compatible. Things to consider. Or do you have a display port, um, which is what most of your high-end graphics folks prefer. But for GIS, any of them should work pretty good, unless we're doing like high-end renderings or things like that. Um, but I think most of us are probably running HDMI by this, this point. Uh, so it doesn't matter. The other thing when you look at your graphics GPU, you want to make sure is the, the memory. Right, so your GPU is going to be fairly set to the card. Not a lot you can spec out there from a GIS perspective, but you can pick memory. Now, for example, ArcGIS Pro, I think, wants a minimum of four gigabytes of, of uh, VRAM. Uh, six is recommended, so that's what you want to do. I'm currently running an NVIDIA uh, RTX 2070 Super, which I think think has six gigabytes of DDR6 memory on it. I think I could be wrong on that. I'll try to verify and if I'm wrong, I'll put up something to correct myself. But it's it's a it's not a super high end, but it's a fairly high end graphics card. Okay, it, you know, it's not an RTX 2080 or 2080 Ti, which are ridiculously expensive, but it's a pretty, pretty decent one. 
um, you can expect to probably spend three to four hundred dollars on a graphics card um, and that'll be in, put into the price obviously if you're buying a pre-built system um, but you know some of those cards can go upwards of 12, 14, 15, 2000 dollars, um, especially if you start getting into the professional workstation level uh, cards uh, up there. So um, just you know keep that in mind. You definitely want to have one. They're going to really improve how you display. I said avoid integrated graphics. You really don't want that. It just it slows your system down. It pulls resources. In GIS, you really want a dedicated GPU. And of course, a pretty decent monitor. Um, I run, well, I'm running two monitors. You can see the big one there on the screen. I also have a secondary 27 inch monitor that I also run um, next to it. So I've got plenty of screen real estate, which is important when we're doing GIS, as well as video editing and things of those nature. So I want to make sure we do that. So there you have it. Those are the basic components that you'll find in any computer system. So hopefully it's helped you kind of get a better idea of what some of the pieces and parts are and what's important. Um, I kept this very high level. I didn't want to go do a deep dive into each one of these. I could do an individual video about each one of these components and the pieces and parts that make up the components and whatnot. And if that is something you'd like to see, by all means, um, let me know if you'd like some other comparisons between, say, manufacturers uh, like Intel or AMD C uh, GPU, CPUs, um, yeah, whatever you want to see. I, you know, I'll be happy to do that. Just let me know about that in, in the comments. So don't want to forget to throw a quick plug in here for my latest uh, ArcGIS Pro book, Learning ArcGIS Pro 2. It's the second edition of my first book, Learning ArcGIS Pro. So all the screen captures have been updated, workflows have been updated to the current version of Arc Pro, the 2.6 version. So um, it's available through Packet Publishing or on Amazon. I'm sure you can find it through other online bookstores. So please take the time to go look it, get it, buy it, love it, and whatnot. So. Uh, with that, you know, if we can help you out with anything GIS related, please feel free to reach out, whether that's enterprise implementation or systems integration between GIS and other solutions. Uh, if you're trying to figure out, gosh, we, we need to upgrade. We're running ArcMap. Uh, we're still on, you know, 10.3. And we really need to start looking at going to Pro and we want to implement ArcGIS Enterprise. and want to do more with Arc Online. And how do we do that? How do we make that happen? We can put together a strategic plan, do a needs assessment for you to really get you down the right path to, to make that a successful um, expansion of your, your system and upgrade. Uh, maybe you have a new project coming up and you don't have enough staff, or maybe you just don't have the expertise in-house for certain components of it. We can help you out there with either on-site staff, with the COVID stuff's a little hinky right now, but... Um, hopefully when that dies down, we can do that, but certainly remote services, we can do that. Whether you need help with updating data, uh, map creation analysis, even creating custom applications or, um, you know, whatever it is, we can, can help you there. And of course, if you need any sort of training, maybe you're already moving to Art Pro and you need to get your staff trained up on how to use it to migrate, uh, their skills from Art Map to Art Pro, we can do that for you. If you just want a safety net. Um, in case something happens and you're, you know, you can't get your map document to load or maybe your ARC server services won't start and you just want to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody and get help. We can do that for you as well. We provide uh, on-site remote tech support services um, as, as well. So feel free to reach out to us, uh, www.egiassociates.com or give us a call at 678-710-9710. Or email us at info at EGISassociates.com. Um, if you have any questions, you need any help, you want to know more about services, or heck, if you just want to talk. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So with that, I uh, hope you liked the video. hope it's been helpful. If it was helpful, give it a thumbs up. If it wasn't helpful, I guess you'd give it a thumbs down. Please make sure you subscribe to the channel um, and hit the notification bell. That way, anytime we post a new video, you'll know when it comes out. And um, with that, well, uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next video.